We welcome all of you this evening to our time in the Word. This will be our eighth message in the series on the second coming of Christ, the parable of the ten virgins. <clears throat> Now, it's unfortunate that the subject of the coming of the Lord has been approached in such a manner as to promote lethargy, indifference, and disinterest. This condition exists because, among our many other things, of the approach that has been taken to the subject of the coming of the Lord. Even if I was not able to identify how this approach was wrong, which I am able to do that, the results it has produced tells you something's wrong. Because the coming of the Lord is a subject that is to alert souls and make them conscious and move them to readiness. Another thing we know because of this condition of people's apathy toward the coming of the Lord and their lack of readiness for it, is that the grace of God has not been preached properly. There are people that, quote, believe in grace. Actually, I don't believe in grace. I believe in God. Amen. But the fact that the grace teaches us this is explicitly stated in Titus 2.13. The grace teaches us to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So whatever we may or may not think about grace, the nominal church doesn't have the faintest idea what it is. Amen. It's not received it, and it's therefore it's not looking for the coming of the Lord. Because grace teaches you to do this. So if people aren't doing it, it's because they have suppressed, if they knew anything at all about the grace of God, they've suppressed it. And a distorted view of Christ's coming has been developed, which presents him as primarily interested in a view of Christ has been introduced at presents him as primarily interested in the lives of people in this world. Now, he is interested in your life in the world, but not primarily, yes. as secondarily. Now, the true perspective of life is living in view of the end. That's the secret to living, probably living in view of the end, it's just not like a terminal point. It's the time when Jesus comes. Then cometh the end. as when Jesus comes. Christ's appearance is a star of hope on the horizon of God's eternal purpose. Now, permit me just to say a brief word about eschatology, the study of last things. This has confused more people than it has ever illuminated. The scriptures do not approach the end of time at the study of last things. That's a human concept. And I'm more and more opposed to it. I mean, it sounds smart, I understand. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about it, I understand. But the coming of the Lord is the focus, Amen. not what's going to happen prior to him coming. And that's what the study of eschatology is about. It's men trying to organize theologically what's going to occur in the last times. And I'm saying that approach is wrong. I'm very dogmatic about this. I mean, if anyone wanted to argue about it, I'm set to argue about it. But this is not a proper approach. Even though the Lord does say things about what's going to happen. I understand. Now let's look at this parable of ten virgins again. 
It's considered like the background. What, what exactly was Jesus talking about when he gave this parable of the ten virgins? Now, this is very disruptive of a lot of theology, but it deserves to be disrupted. He was teaching about the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's what he was talking about before this parable. He was talking about a day and an hour that was unknown. Yeah. Which was this day we just heard about. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He's talking about when Jesus comes. To nail it down even further, verses 37 through 41 of Matthew 24 says, But as the days of Noah were, so also is the coming of the Son of Man, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Say, who was left? Well, he said it was at the days of Noah. It was the same situation as the days of Noah. Who was left? Amen. Who was taken in the days of Noah and who was left? Huh? Noah was left. The godly people were left. Amen. I'm sorry, but the man that wrote and promoted Left Behind is just like wrong, 100% wrong. And he's going to be judged Amen. for perpetrating that view. And people, you'd be amazed how many people believe that who's left. Two would be at the grant the mill, one taken, one left. You'd be surprised who generally thinks that it's the, the one that was saved is the one taken. That's not what he's saying. The one that was taken was the one that wasn't saved. The one that was saved is the one left, just like it was with Noah, just like it was with Lot. Who was taken and who was left? Who was left when Sodom was destroyed? Who was left? Jesus also said that his coming would be like the day, like Sodom and Gomorrah. He said this it would be just the same way. Who was left? It was Lot that was left. During this time, people are going to be living normal lives. They're going to be going through the, the normal routine of life. Marrying, giving in marriage, eating, drinking. It's going to be in the normal. Even though I understand that there's, there's going to be things happening that's going to be frightening, but it's not going to disrupt the normalities of life. They're going to just keep on, keep on going. And then Jesus sounds the warning in Matthew 24:42 Watch Watch therefore for ye know not the day nor the hour your lord comes watch be alert uh, Now I want to say something here about the necessity of developing this waiting and looking attitude <clears throat> This has got to begin when your children are young, really young. You have to teach them before they can talk, before they can reason, that we're not here to play games. They've got to learn to associate gatherings like this with preparation. 
Oh, it's not going to be intelligent. I understand that, but they've got to be trained to know you cannot act like an ignoramus in this assembly. Parents have to teach the children that, and it's not a simple thing to do. Those of you that have children know that, but this has got to be done. Because otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for children that were raised up like wild Indians to think about getting ready. It's going to be very hard because their nature was formed around themselves. They were taught from little children up, you can get what you want if you bell her long enough. You got to thrash that out of them. I'm telling you the truth. You have to do that because this thing of readiness, you don't want to have to overcome your children to overcome the way they were raised up to think about getting ready. It's like a, a thing of perception. It's perception that's developed. They, they aren't going to be able to explain it to you, but there's going to, they're going to be trained up in the way of the Lord. Because when you come of age, you can start to think and start to put thoughts together. You're going to have to start thinking about Christ coming. You may be 9, 10, 11, however. You've got to be able to think like this. And I'm telling you that I don't think there's a youth minister in the world that's teaching young people to do this. If there is, they sure are the exception. This is that critical of a matter. Give your children the full advantage of getting to the age of where they can think and reason and being able to start preparing for the coming of the Lord. And it'll scare them at first. Don't talk, calm it down when it scares them. Don't, don't calm it down. Instruct them what can be done for those that have. You can work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, you can do this. I say that because uh, I'm concerned about our culture and the disadvantage that people are at by the time they get ready to do some thinking. They're at such a disadvantage, it's very difficult for them to recover from it. But the word of the king is, watch. He didn't say, now all you adults watch. <laughs> he meant that whoever can comprehend this, I'm coming again, whoever can kind of make sense out of that, watch, look for it. Which means there's some indicators you'll be able to spot it, must be drawn near. James said the judge is standing at the door. <laughs> be alert. So Jesus says, what I say, I, what I say to all, watch. And even he, he tells them that even worldly people know about preparation. Even worldly people know about preparation. Matthew 24, 43, know this, that if the goodman of the house had known what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Even worldly people know this. Someone called him on a phone and said, Sometime after midnight, we're going to break in and rob your house. A lot of people would make preparations not to be caught unawares. Now the king has told you, I'm coming. I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming because not even, I don't even know when I'm coming. But I'm coming, so I'm telling you, watch, keep alert. Don't let dullness settle over your soul. Don't let it. Be alert. Don't allow yourself to be distracted to lesser things. Watch and be alert. Therefore, be also ready. Be ready. Be ready. Now, this goes back to what I had mentioned about teaching children. And I speak as one that raised 10 myself, so I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about something I don't know anything about. That they've got to learn to be watchful and ready. At first, it's not going to be watching for the Lord. They'll be watching you. And you want to get to the point. Now, it's not easy. You want to get to the point where they, you can guide them with your eye. With, see, they're learning to watch. You see my point that I'm making here? They're learning to watch. Because that's what they're going to have to do. When they come of age, they're going to have to watch. 
for the coming of the Lord. Also, he told in this 24th chapter, this is the context on which the 25th chapter is given, that this coming of the Lord is going to be a time of exaltation for the people who are watching and ready. Matthew 24, 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom the Lord hath made ruler over his house to give him his meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. For verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. His. It's a steward's goods. See, they don't belong to him yet. Think of that. You're good and faithful, you'll be exalted. Nobody on earth may have recognized you as God's steward. Nobody may have appreciated it. Your family may not have appreciated it. Your mate may not have appreciated it. Your children may not, your parents may not appreciate the fact that you're a steward, but you stuck with it. And after Jesus comes, the whole universe is going to know. You were a good and faithful steward, and believe me, it'll be worth it, won't it, Amen. at that time. Yeah. That's the background now to this parable. Amen. Now, what did these uh, ten virgins have in common? Judah touched on this. They were all virgins. We're not talking about drunkards and harlots. We're not talking about drug addicts. Yeah. We're not talking about murderers, thieves. We're talking about religious people. Amen. All ten of them were virgins. They had in some way given themselves over to God. Yeah. See, they were. he's not talking about people in the world that are ungodly. That's not even who he's talking about. He was specifically talking about the Jews, and particularly he's also talking about everyone who names the name of the Lord. They're like virgins that to some extent have separated themselves from the world and have not allowed the things of the world to dominate them. They're this kind of people. They all went out to meet the bridegroom. So they had some commitment. All ten of them had this commitment. It wasn't just that some of them went out. They all went out to meet the bridegroom. They all slumbered and slept. They all passed through periods of test and periods of relative isolation and periods where the things were settled down. They all passed through those. And they all had an ear to hear. They all heard, Behold, the bridegroom comes. They all heard it. Yeah, amen. All had an ear to hear. They all rose up to meet him. Uh -huh. Even some overestimated their strength. <laughs> they didn't realize what was involved in meeting the bridegroom. They had somehow been lulled to sleep in their souls. And they thought in an average, common, nominal state they could face the Lord of glory. Suddenly they were going to find out this was they were completely wrong in their assessment. Well, I shudder to think of the number of Christians that are slopping their way through life, living just like the Lord isn't going to come for 10,000 years or they're going to live that long. I shudder when I think of the jeopardy they're in. They all rose up to meet him. They all trimmed their lamps. <laughs> they all thought they were prepared. But there were some ways in which they differed. Five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They were inherently wise, and they were inherently foolish. The wise, this was really what they were, wise. The other versions, this is really what they were, foolish. In regard to the end of time, some were wise, five were wise, some were foolish. 
in your assessment. In regard to the coming of the Lord, some were wise and some were foolish. See, some people's religion seems to hold them up during the normal times. And any, any departure from the norm puts them at a loss. If they sense the Lord is demanding more of them or requiring more of their time or demanding that they crucify the flesh or demanding that they not be equally yoked together with unbelievers. It's like an intrusion on their freedom, they think. But it's not. Those who object to this are foolish. They're foolish. Jesus does not ask anybody to do anything that is non-essential. The lamps of the foolish went out, and the lamps of the wise, they're able to keep them burning. There came a time, there's going to come a time, when the ordinary, the average, the casual is not going to work. Now it appears to work. You can go to church and sleep. Or your mind can be engaged in other things. Or you cannot live for the Lord at all. You can just, if I'm not too busy, I'm just so forth that I'll serve the Lord. And it looks like that's working. But when Jesus comes, everybody's going to find out it is not working. Amen. See, they thought they stood. All of the virgins thought they stood. Some were foolish, they didn't. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. That's a foolish person. Be not high-minded, Romans 11, 20 said. Be not high-minded, but fear. Don't think that God could cut off the Israelites, but he surely couldn't cut you off. Don't, don't be, don't be high-minded. Don't say like a church of Laodicea, I am rich. I don't have need of anything. Look what... Look how the Lord's blessed me. I couldn't possibly be any happier than I am right now. My best life is right now. That's the foolish, that's the foolish view. Because Jesus is going to take away everything that these people put their confidence in. It's all going to go up in flames. The wise, though, they, they had extra oil. They didn't assume things were going to end right away. They knew enough about God to know, I may not have this all calculated out. I, I, think, I think his coming is pretty near. I think we're just out of the verge of the marriage, but I'm not that sure. I'm going to bring some extra oil with me. I'm going to prepare myself for the long haul. See, that's what wise people do. They don't assume they're going to live till they're 100. So I'm going to provide for the long haul, living with the Lord, no matter how old I am, no matter when I depart. I want, extra, I want some extra oil. I want more oil than what it appears I need. I don't want to have to go and try and get some oil at the last minute. Some people do, they wait till they're in a hospital bed dying. Yeah. I'm not saying God can't save a person like that, because I know he can. But you don't want to bank on this. Because right. right. there were two thieves, you know. Yeah. Huh? The thief on the cross that got in, there was another thief that didn't get in. He wasn't ready. Yeah. Extra oil. This is like Ephesians 3.19 says, being filled with all the fullness of God. Yeah, it may be that, if I may just speak plainly, it may be that in your life, there's a part of your life that God isn't prominent in. And you don't really like it that way, but that's kind of the way it is, and you're wondering what to do about it. I'm... There's a part of my life that when I'm in that part, I can forget the things of God pretty easy. And you've got to correct this. Amen. You've got to get oil in there. Amen. 
got to have the extra oil in these parts that look on the surface like they're allowable, they're interesting, there's some benefit to them, but they're not directly connected. You got to get oil in there. You got to connect them with Christ. Even those things, whether it's a job or whatever, recreation or whatever it is, you got to get oil in there and be ready. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. That's like having the extra oil. Be filled with the Spirit. So that when something happens you didn't anticipate, you can react correctly. Be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's Colossians 1.9. Be filled with the extra oil. If you've got some extra time to invest in something, invest it in your soul. Don't sell your soul to the devil. There's other people want your soul too, you understand this. There's other people want your soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul, Jesus said. Don't give up any oil. Have extra oil. When the bridegroom came, the wives were ready. The foolish were not. Now he's going to come in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, so you won't have time to get ready <laughs> at that time. In a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump, they were ready. The wives were ready. They were involved being prepared for delay. They knew sometimes you got to wait for what's good. In fact, most of the time you do. That's been my experience. It's been years. Most of the time, for the good things of God, you do. Most of the time, you do have to wait. Which is a blessed thing. You're learning to wait. The wise went into the marriage, and the foolish were denied entrance. You remember when it came, and suddenly the foolish became aware. Whoa, we don't have any oil. Our brothers and sisters do. They got oil. We'll go to them. Right, right, get some oil from them. We'll even offer to pay for it. No. Five wise virgins said no. I mean, we love you and all that. We can't sell you any of our oil. Because this appearing of the Lord, this is going to use up. <laughs> to pass through this, we've got to use up every bit of oil we got. There's going to be nothing left. So we can't. There's some people selling oil. They still got these TV ministries that are going on. Maybe you can go over there and buy some oil. My God knew they couldn't. Jesus knew they couldn't. What he's telling you, he's not teaching you at the last minute you'll have it. There'll be some people you can run to. What he's saying is that if you wait till the last minute, you waited too long. And even if somebody did have some oil, they wouldn't give it to you. Wouldn't even sell it to you. You will not. In other words, God's going to turn the tap off. When Jesus comes, grace, as it's associated with salvation and the commencement of it, is going to be turned off. You're not going to be able to get in. But the runs that were ready went in while the others were trying to get ready. Remember, while they were away, then they, the door was open to them, and they went in while the others were trying to get ready. When they came in back, they, they pounded on the door. They, they knew that Jesus had been represented as a loving Savior, and he died for us, you know, you gave yourself for us, you loved us. Jesus said, well... The day of salvation is over. You had your time. Now the summer's gone, the harvest is past, and you're not saved. There's not a thing we can do about it now. I told you to watch. I told you not to give yourself to surfeiting. I told you I was right up front with you about it. I told you that if, he, if the Lord comes and you're not ready, you're not getting in. Period. I gave you time to get ready. I gave you the grace to get ready. I gave you the Holy Spirit to get ready. I gave you the gospel. I, I sent ministers to you to remind you that you weren't ready yet. Get ready. 
Get ready. I'm coming. Get ready. Now, I don't even know who you are. I depart from me. I, I don't even know who you are. I don't recognize your virginity. Because you didn't give it to me. Like you should have. So the fundamental thing, dear brethren, is being ready when the bridegroom comes. Amen. That's the fundamental thing. You can't bank on somebody else getting you ready. You've got to get ready. That involves subduing the flesh, subordinating the flesh, cutting off every sin of weight that does so easily besets you, not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers, setting your affection on things above and not on things on the earth, continuing to run the race even though it's hard to run it, run it anyway, it's it all, all that's involved in getting ready. Here's what will happen as you begin to get ready. There's some things that you're gonna, they're not going to seem important anymore. All of a sudden, you'll say, well, that, that's not as important as I thought it was. I can see that uh, that thing's been holding me back. I didn't realize it till now. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. It, the coming of the Lord's going to surprise, from one standpoint, the coming of the Lord's going to surprise everybody. But from another standpoint, some will have made themselves ready for it. Be watchful. Matthew 24, 42. Watch, therefore. Another place he said, what I say to one, I say to all. Watch. So tonight, you watch the news. You hear the news. You got to see behind it. Things are being shook up. There's agitation going on in the world. Wars and rumors of wars. The stuff Jesus said was going to precede. So you got to watch and say, boy, whatever's been slowing me down, I'm going to get rid of it tonight. I'm serious about this. Whatever's slowing me down, I'm going to shuck it off tonight. Nobody can dictate to you on how to do this. We can tell you this is necessary. Because every little distraction bleeds off your oil. <laughs> every little distraction. You've got to manage your life yourself. We, we can't. We each have our hands full managed in our own life, so we can't really manage anybody else's life, but we can manage our own and remind the other brethren that manage. You're a king, aren't you? God has made you a king. Your domain is your body. Rule it. Amen. Keep under it. Master your affections. Refuse to let deviant affections surface. Subordinate them. See? Put off the old man. Put him off. Crucify him. Give yourself every possible advantage for the day the Lord comes. And you will be glad you did. Amen. When Jesus descends with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ are raised first and then the body of Christ is joined together to the Lord, you will be glad you made yourself ready. You will have no regrets. You will not view it as an inconvenience. <laughs> not at all. It is not possible to not be ready and Jesus still receive you. It, this is not possible. If it was possible, the Lord would have, wouldn't have been so insistent that you be ready. So now you've got to uh, assess yourself, judge yourselves, as the scripture says. You've got to judge yourself. Am I ready? Am I ready just for a sudden disconnect <laughs> with everything in the world? Am I, am I ready for this to be disconnected 
from my body, from the world, from the scene? Am I ready to be disconnected instantly? Can I survive a disconnection like this? Or will it be that my demise? See, now's the time to evaluate that and judge that. God will help you. Grace will teach you how to do it. This is not an impossible task because all the power and grace of God is devoted to making this happen. But God insists that you be reconciled to the fact that this, your readiness is essential. You have to be ready. And once you reconcile yourself to this, say, I see this, I'm going to be ready. Then all these heavenly resources, they like surround you. And everything you need to get ready will be given to you. God. And you'll, you'll see yourself. You'll, you'll feel more comfortable about talking about the coming of the Lord. Amen. And you'll have more confidence about speaking about it. What I say to one, I say to all, be ready. You may be a virgin, so to speak, but be a wise one. Amen. Don't be a foolish one. Brother Aaron has our word of exhortation.